We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? All right. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, it has become a way of life. Come on! You have to do your best because somebody's family are relying on you to save them. Looking out across the Solent towards the Isle of Wight is the small coastal village of Calshot. Calshot is down the south coast of England and we are on the busiest shipping lane in the Solent. The Solent is a stretch of water that links Southampton out past the Isle of Wight and then goes on to France or wherever you want to go. We've got a wide range of vessels that operate in these waters, container ships, cruise ships, jet skis, Yachts, sailing boats, everything. It's a real busy place to be. Watching over this waterway, as it has done for more than half a century, is the Cowshot lifeboat. So what we've got looking around us pretty much sums up the different types of vessels. Ahead of the lifeboat, we've got a car transporter. And then we've got the Red Funnel ferry that goes between Southampton and Cowes. Because you've got the Isle of Wight, it's a fairly sheltered area of water, and that's what makes it so popular for leisure craft. The proximity of the Isle of Wight also creates a funnel effect between the island and the mainland. If you get caught on a current, it will take you out and you can be stranded in the shipping lane. You don't want to be there when big ships are coming down on you because they can't just stop. You need to get out of the way and quick. As well as all the pleasure craft and around 80,000 commercial ships passing through the Solent each year, there are eight RNLI stations here and a further eight independent lifeboats. 25% of the lifeboats around the UK are, are independents and there's over 50 of them all the way around the United Kingdom. So yeah, not every lifeboat is an RNLI lifeboat. The independent ones, they do a great thing, whereas we respond to pages from the Coast Guard. They go out on patrol and help out where they can, really. We're all there to do one job, ultimately, and that's to save lives. Mid-June, early Friday evening. The hottest day of the year so far. The weather was just absolutely stunning, so, of course, everyone flocks to the beach for a nice sunny day. I just got a drink and was sitting in the garden, and then the page went off. It was immediate launch, and that's where there is life in danger. As soon as minimum crew three on the D-Class gets down there and is changed, you go, you go. You don't wait around for anybody. Who's going on the boat? Me, Andy and Chris, by the looks of it. Because of the urgency, there was some shore crew getting the boat to the slipway. You jump on the helm, Chris. Yep. And then we were able to launch it fairly immediately. As the lifeboat launches and heads out into the Solent, the crew radio the Coast Guard for more details. First bit of information was someone had come off a jet ski just off the front of the station. They told us that the casualty was in the vicinity of Cowshot Spit, so we were heading round towards the front of the spit, and that's where we saw the police heading towards us. You just pass alongside the police, we have, and we'll see what's going on. Although the location is just a few minutes from the station, when the May Day went out, a marine police vessel launched and the Solent Independent lifeboat was already on the water. They have now located the casualty. They're on board, Solent Rescue. They've got him on board that way. And we put one of our guys, the medic body, put oxygen on it. Now they have. They need three here at the moment. Thank you. 
Even as the cow shot crew are brought up to speed by the marine police, the independent Solent lifeboat is rushing the casualty to shore. He was completely unresponsive when we pulled him from the water, so just a very, very shallow, faint breathing rate, but otherwise completely unresponsive. Aware that the casualty is still far from safe, the cow shot crew speed past the Solent lifeboat in order to be ready to assist the moment they land. Just beach it, mate. Beach it. Beach it. Yeah. So we decided to beach the D-class, and literally within seconds, we had the Solent rescue rib coming in with the casualty on board. With limited information from the Marine Police about the casualty's condition, emergency care trained Kelly and paramedic Andy weighed in to find out more. Is he conscious? They told us that the casualty was unconscious but breathing. And that's when Andy jumped up onto the boat and started assessing. Hello, buddy. Maybe give my hand a squeeze. The casualty wasn't responding to a voice, um, wasn't responding to any pain stimulus. Lifeless is the best way of explaining it. He looked lifeless. I need the oxygen out. Can you get an O piece as well? Because they're in there. He was breathing, but he still needed some help. Uh, so we got an OP airway in and gave him some oxygen. The priority in that situation is to stop him getting worse. He's down here. Uh, yeah. We had oxygen on him. Coming up beside you. Then it was looking at getting him ashore so we could do a full assessment. Amazing. That's when I could see that he had stopped breathing. The priority immediately switches from carefully transferring the casualty to getting him ashore as fast as possible. I felt for a pulse. We literally just had to put him straight over onto the beach as quick as possible try and revive this guy. The lack of pulse indicates that the casualty has gone into cardiac arrest. Every second now could mean the difference between life and death. Get on his chest. Someone on his chest. I'll get this, yeah. I just went straight onto his chest and started giving CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And he was on airway, 14. and I was on chest compressions. 20. You pump the heart 30 times, 30. and then you give two breaths, and then go back to 30 times, two breaths, until you get a sign of life. You've got this young man who is technically dead. And all that kept going through my head was, he was someone's son, someone's brother. He needed to go back to them. And that was what was, yeah, in my mind. Oh, dear me. <laughs> oh. I'm just going to have a feel of his pulse when you're off again. Back on the chest. The person is dead. If you don't give CPR, they've got no chance of survival. Even with CPR, the, the chance of survival is still very slim. We'll get the uh, defib on him. I do remember thinking at that time, this isn't going well. You know, there's a, a real chance that, that this might be too late. After six rounds of CPR and still no sign of life, defibrillator pads are prepared and applied to the casualty's chest. But just as they prepare to shock the casualty. He's breathing. We got a pulse back and it was amazing. It was it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's it. I couldn't believe it. Obviously he was still very poorly, but you know, we'd given him a fighting chance. No, mister. Wakey wakey. As soon as you hear that that casualty's got his pulse back... Yeah, come on, darling. ..that's when you think, OK, let's make sure that we're not going to lose this again. We'll some plus drainage. With the casualty's heart beating again, the crew continue their battle to keep him alive. We turned him onto his side to keep his airway clear, and it's a better position to be in. Have we got a blanket or something? Blanket. Get off him. <laughs> 
having done what they can with the equipment they have. The crew continue to monitor and comfort the still unconscious casualty until the ambulance arrives. Come on, sweetheart, open them eyes. We have no name as of yet, and he has come off a jet ski um, and taken in some water, from what I can believe. Uh, we have done some chest compressions. Paramedic arrived with the ambulance and we handed over to them. Okay. So, if you're happy being on the monitor, yep. and can you just keep an eye on you know, the sats and things yep. and then he's still right. breathing spontaneously? Yep. As the paramedics prepare to carry the casualty to the ambulance. Right. We're going to do the lift now. Is everyone happy? Yep. Yep. We're on the, yep. on the basket we'll lift him. One of his friends on the beach puts in a call to the casualty's father. I was at home, and my partner got a phone call saying that Dan had an accident. On lift, ready, steady, lift. I just thought that he had knocked himself out and he was going to hospital with a concussion. So we needed to get down there to bring him home again. OK. Probably need a few hands just to get over the rocks here once we're secure, guys. While we was en route, we had another phone call saying that they've now got Dan breathing, which I said I didn't know he wasn't breathing. Ready, steady, roll. So, yeah, that made it a harder journey. So now, how sort of serious it was now. Everyone ready? Okay, yeah. yeah what made it particularly hard for David was that he'd been in this situation before. We lost our daughter in 2016. Crossing the road, the lights went green and an Arctic lorry pulled off and basically took her under it. Her last action was to push the pushchair away to save her daughter. Now we're raising a granddaughter um, and we couldn't lose another child now. We walked into the A&E just expecting, oh, yeah, Dan's being seen, take a seat in the waiting room. They said, come to the family room. And my knees nearly buckled because we've been to a family room before and I, I knew it wasn't good. Yeah, no, it wasn't good. David was told that Dan had suffered two brain injuries one from falling off the jet ski and one from oxygen starvation. They put him into an induced coma to stop the brain working and damaging itself more. Every day was hoping Dan would start waking up, but just no sign, no sign of life, nothing. Just basically watching him sleep, hand on my heart. I didn't think he had a chance. I was in a coma for about three and a half weeks. And then I come back round and I was in the Royal Bark Hospital. I remember my dad, my girlfriend and my mum come to visit me. And that's, that's the only thing I can remember. Dan had travelled down from Reading to spend the day jet skiing with friends but can remember nothing of the day or his accident. The doctors told me that I'd fell off of a jet ski and had a traumatic brain injury, which resulted in me being pretty much paralyzed for a few weeks. And then at the Royal Bark Hospital, they got me walking back to how I am today. I feel very lucky, very lucky to still be here. Because, I mean, I died on that day, didn't I? So then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. There was definitely a guardian angel watching over me. Daniel definitely had his sister on his shoulder that day. But everyone was put there where they needed to be, which saved Daniel's life. He is alive. He's with his family. And that's amazing, isn't it? He got a second chance. Life is precious, and it can be taken away in a split second. And, uh, yeah, he was a lucky boy, really lucky boy. As well as dropping everything when the pager sounds, the volunteer crews of the RNLI also train regularly so that when the call does come, everyone is primed and ready. 
We train on a Wednesday and we train on a Sunday. Thank you. We all have to know what we're doing, have to keep that knowledge in our heads. We're very fortunate to have a strong and robust training system. We go through lots of different scenarios, lots of different situations. Six months of the year we're out training in the dark. Six months of the year training in the daylight. It costs about £1,500 per year to train each crewman. This ranges from on-job training to doing emergency procedures in the purpose-built facility. We train hard because we train for tough conditions. Things go wrong, but we're trained and prepared for it. We use all the training, all your skills, you know, working as a team. One, two, three, roll. Because we want everyone to go home to their families like we're going to at the end of the shout. In the northwest of England, lying between two major rivers, is a 60 square mile area of land known as the Wirral Peninsula. The Wirral Peninsula is in between Liverpool and North Wales. So it's three sides surrounded by the water, the River Mersey on the north, the River Dee on the south, and Liverpool Bay out to the west. The Wirral is what I consider an area of outstanding natural beauty. We get a lot of tourists and a lot of visitors to the beaches. Ramblers walking along the banks. Also, undoubtedly, the North Wirral Peninsula has some of the best sunsets that you'll ever see. But as well as all this beauty, the Wirral also has a darker side. What makes the Wirral Peninsula unique from other coastal areas is our large tidal range, which can be 10 metres between low and high water. That's 10 metres of water rushing in at a faster pace than you can walk. With the high tidal ranges and the geography of the beaches, we have a lot of mud flats. The mud in the area is particularly dangerous. It will suck people in up to the waist deep, chest deep, and you, you cannot free yourself. The more you wriggle, the deeper you're going to go down into the mud. The Wirral has a long tradition of lifeboating with three stations based here, West Kirby, New Brighton and Hoy Lake, which may be one of the oldest stations in the network, but has one of the newest pieces of kit. At Hoy Lake, we have an inshore rescue hovercraft. The hovercraft flies on a cushion of air, so we can literally go over sea, land, mud, as the tides change, as the mud becomes more prevalent, humans can't walk there, but the hovercraft can get almost anywhere. Tuesday afternoon at the end of February, cold and overcast, the tide fully out but on the rise. Well, it's actually the second time Pager went off for the day. We just finished putting the hovercraft away. The initial information we received was there was a casualty stuck in the mud at the mouth of the River Alls. Where the casualty was stuck is horrendous. It looks like it's nice and flat, and then suddenly you drop down and you are waist deep in the mud. We still had two hours of flood tide to go, which means the tide is still coming in. If we don't get to the casualty in time, he could drown. The Hoy Lake hovercraft launches quickly, but as they head to location eight nautical miles away on the far side of the River Mersey, they encounter a problem. The wind just happened to be right on the nose of the hovercraft, so as soon as we hit the wall, so we just slowed right down. As the hovercraft flies, the wind affects it the same as it would an aircraft. Instead of doing 21, 22 knots, you could be doing as little as five, and it doesn't take a mathematician to realise that's going to take us four times as long to get to a casualty. We updated the Coast Guard and they took the decision, given how precarious the situation of the casualty was, to pay to New Brighton. At New Brighton, the crew have an Atlantic 85, which can power through the water and is much less affected by the wind. Within minutes, they launch and head rapidly to location. Once we hit the water, we went at full speed, making about 32 knots against the incoming tide. 
looked down the North Weddell coast and I could see Hoy Lake coming along the beaches. It was quite obvious at that point that we were probably going to be the first on scene. That switches our train of thought from one of support to one of uh, first response. The new Brighton crew starts scanning the mud flats, looking for any sign of the casualty. We knew the tide was coming in. You could see it rising all the time around us. We also knew that depending where the casualty was, that the tide could surround him uh, and potentially drown him. Yeah, this gully here now coming on my port beam. Yeah, there it is, the casualty was quite low down in a gully. We could just see the top of his head. Yeah, eyes on casualty now. That increased our sense of urgency to be able to get him out. Mike dropped myself and Tristan onto the shore to try and make our way to the casualty. As Mike and Tristan make their way carefully across the mud from one direction, on the other side, the hovercraft is still battling against the wind. The atmosphere on board was one of anticipation but also trepidation. We were going slower than we would have liked, and we knew that every second counted to get to the casualty in this instance. It takes the Hoylake crew almost 50 minutes to reach location, by which time the two new Brighton crew have reached the casualty, along with trained firemen and the Coast Guard. There's a definite nervousness when you arrive on scene and you're not involved directly, but some of your colleagues are. You know how deep he is in, you know where the water is, you know how fast it's flowing, and it was really time critical that the guys got him out. Even with so many rescuers on hand, the precarious position of the casualty at the bottom of a gully means only a few people at a time can dig him out. It's extremely easy for us to get stuck in the mud. The last thing we wanted to do was turn ourselves into casualties. Yeah, mate, yeah I've got eyes on. He's, uh, he's conscious and breathing. He's um, attempting to free him now. Being stuck in mud is very dangerous. Apart from getting cold, hypothermic, uh, you can also suffer from hydrostatic squeeze. Hydrostatic squeeze is when there's pressure built up around your lower limbs, so the blood will stop going there. And then when we pull the casualties clear, the sudden rush of blood going back down to the limbs can cause the, the casualties to collapse. Howie, are you all right for us to get the blankets out and get yeah, yeah, yeah. prepare? Yeah. As the new Brighton crew continue to dig, Dave on the Hoy Lake hovercraft prepares to take the casualty ashore the moment he is freed. They're trying to pull him up, right? I would say the water's to him now. Fortunately, the incoming tide also starts to liquefy the mud and loosen its grip on the casualty. Right, they seem to have him out now, so he's heading in this general direction. Once the guys have got him freed, we managed to roll him onto the rescue sledge. And then we had to pull him up the side of this mud bank to the hovercraft. When we saw him on the sled, you breathe a sigh of relief, but the job's only half done at that point. You've only stopped one potential avenue of disaster. Okay, turn around, stop down on there. There you go. Wow. Casualties, a lot of the time, once they see rescuers, the whole relief of, oh, we're being rescued, next minute can take a, a terrible turn and they can uh, they can even go into collapse or shock. Hi, Sealer. Uh, yeah, just just take yourself a seat here. When we brought the casualty on board, he presented as very cold. Because it's wet through, is it? He was compliant, but he looked like he was probably in shock. I do need to put our life jackets on if I'm flying over water, really. That's great. Now we're cooking on gas. Obviously, we're thinking now, because he'd been in the mud for so long, hypothermia. So we wrapped him up in thermal hats and towels, blankets. We had him sat down low, out in the wind as well. I think that's, that's possibly the muddiest place I've ever seen. And we've been to some very muddy places. 
I was very cold, I was shaking with the cold. And to get on a hovercraft and know that I'm going to be taken to shore and I'll be safe was such a relief, really was. Mark had arranged to meet a group of fellow ramblers on the beach. But running late after missing his train, he took a shortcut to try and catch up with them. So I'm walking across the mud flats and I'm thinking to myself, the sooner I get across this mud, the better when it comes to a slope down into a gully. I put one foot in and my momentum meant that I couldn't pull myself back. Both feet went in and within five seconds, I was stuck to my waist in the mud. Might be a little bit bumpy, but it's all fine. I could feel it pulling me in more and more. It was like a pressure around me. You couldn't possibly pull your feet out at all. I would say within 10, 15 seconds of being in the mud, I got my phone out and uh, I dialed uh, 999. Don't go, mate. Oh, yeah, fine. You are aware of the fact that the tide's coming in and you're surrounded by it, and you think to yourself, well, if they don't come soon, um, I could be in trouble here. There we go. I would say five minutes more and he'd have drowned. Let's just pop this back on and keep your head warm. It's a, a valuable piece of kit, even if it does make you look like a medieval monk. <laughs> when we arrived at the rendezvous point, the paramedics were there with the ambulance and the fire brigade and coast guard were all there to assist. But he was happy to walk up to the ambulance himself. How do you feel, Mark? Um, a bit shocked, there, but I think I'm all right, though. It's all good. Yeah, you'll be fine now. In the hands of the experts now. Yes. If it wasn't for the multi-agency approach, if it was just left with Hoyleg to, to go in those weather conditions, the situation could have been very different. I felt a great sense of pride in what we've done. As a team, we've saved someone's life. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Be well, Mark, all right? It's worth doing on the training for those kind of shouts. Mark was taken to Aintree Hospital, where it took three hours to warm him back up. Roughly the same amount of time it took the lifeboat crews to clean their kit. <laughs> Don't even come near me unless you're gonna walk at the train home. <laughs> this was a job well done by our crew, by the other crews and the other agencies involved. Without us all pulling together as one, the outcome would have been so much different. You horrible lot. Can't take you anywhere. <laughs> on the opposite side of the country, and home to one of the busiest passenger ferry terminals in the world, is the historic port town of Dover. Dover's a busy town. We have the ferry industry locally, which means that we have lots of traffic travelling through the town. Perception of Dover is likely that you probably pass through it going to somewhere nicer on the continent. Dover might be seen as not the tidiest of places, but actually it's really, really beautiful. It's got so much history to it. There's some rich heritage in Dover. You very rarely get the chance to see Dover from seaside, and until you do, you can't really appreciate how actually beautiful it is. You see the castle, the piers, and obviously our lovely lifeboat station. Come down. Nice and steady. As a Dover crew member, Pete regularly gets a seaside view of the town during training and on shouts. There you go, perfect. But he also works for a charity enabling others to see it too. I volunteer for a foundation called Wet Wheels. And what Wet Wheels does, it gives people of all disabilities an opportunity to get on a pleasure craft and give it a go. Do you do two hands? Go for it, off we go. As soon as they put those hands on the wheel and realise that they're moving a big boat with 600 horsepower is an absolute shock to them, I think. It's like, oh my God, I've never done this before. It's Dover Castle. I volunteer because I can. You're doing very well, by the way. If I can give something back, then why not? OK, Curtis, you're the captain. Off we go. The time I get with these people is only short, but it's very memorable. I, I think I remember every trip. 
Look at the sun on the sea. Can you see it? Yeah. That's beautiful. Giving something back to someone that have got disabilities when they wouldn't normally be able to do this in any other environment is fantastic. I can't, I can't really put words to it. Curtis, you're smashing it out of the park, aren't you, Curtis? <laughs> yeah. You're smashing it out of the park. Oh, good. good man. <laughs> And there's our seven-class lifeboat. Wow. So about 40 tonnes, that is. Oh, my God. And you see that chap on the back? That's John. Hi, John. John is the full-time coxswain here and has been a crew member for 24 years. My relationship with the boat, yeah, I love her. We look after her, but more importantly, she looks after us, and she gives us confidence in awkward uh, situations. About to turn 65, John's time at the helm of the Dover lifeboat is coming to an end. I'm not looking forward to retiring, but it's something that you've got to do. Uh, your mind is never as old as uh, your body is, but, uh, yeah, uh, I shall look forward to some uninterrupted night's sleep. With these busy waters providing a wide range of emergencies, the Dover crew respond to over 100 shouts a year. If there's a ferry that's in distress, we'll go out to them. There's a quite a big fishing community, especially right next to the port. You get a lot of anglers off there. Even though it's within the harbour, it can still be quite a dangerous place if people get into trouble. Yachts that might need towing, we're, we're trained to go and tow them. There's definitely a diverse range of shouts. When that pager goes off, you really don't know what you're going to be going to. A dark and stormy Monday night in late February. The pager went off about half past ten at night. I was sat at home watching TV. I stopped everything I was doing and drove to the station. The first information we got was that someone had seen a light flashing from the outside wall of the Admiralty Pier. The Admiralty Pier is a very popular spot for uh, angling. People do tend to walk out on the very small ridges of the flare. The trouble is the tide comes in very, very quickly, pushes them up, and then they've got nowhere to go. The crew launch in 15 minutes. But although the Admiralty Pier is next to the lifeboat station, the light has been spotted on the exposed outboard side, and the rising tide means time is against them. The Admiralty Pier is a very difficult place to rescue someone at night. We have to proceed approximately a mile to sea to exit the western entrance and then double back on ourselves. There's definitely a sense of urgency. John was telling us he wants to prep the Y boat. Up, 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 up. The Y boat is a small inflatable dinghy carried aboard the ALB to be used in shallower waters. The Y boat can be the safest way of extracting someone. It's quite low down, very manoeuvrable, and it can easily transport one or two people back to our seven class lifeboat. The deck crew prepare the Y boat for launch as the lifeboat exits the harbour, giving the crew their first taste of the raw sea state. As soon as you get out of the protection of the port, the tidal conditions do change very rapidly. On that particular night, it would be a flood tide, so it's coming up the channel. Plus, we had a southwest force five to six. Yeah, it's a little bit lumpy. Once you get to the other side of the pier, you get the effects of the backwash. Oh, it's swapping up there a bit. The waves hit the pier and then reflect off it and then start breaking into each other and that can make it very, very uncomfortable. It can be quite violent. The crew begin their search along the sea wall for any fishermen, aware that the waves now battering their boat will be far more dangerous for them. We knew it was the Admiralty Pier, but that's quite a broad location. We were scanning up and down the searchlights. They're saying that there's lights on the steps. Oh, yeah, it looks like there is some on there. We saw them under the searchlight and they didn't have any safety equipment with them. They had no life jackets at all. These two lads were standing on possibly a three-foot-wide ledge, and if they'd have had just one wave enough to knock them, they'd have been in the water, nobody would have seen them, and they'd have been swept to sea immediately. 
they were in grave and imminent danger. Two life jackets, guys! Two life jackets! The rough conditions mean that the plan to extract the casualties using the Y-boat is no longer a safe option. With that sort of sea, if she'd have been caught beam on, there was a good chance that she would have capsized. We don't want to put ourselves in more danger than we need to be rescued ourselves. So we had to think of a different approach. There's no safe point for the Coast Guard to get on there, and even a helicopter extraction there would have probably been too risky. We were their only chance. All uh, right, I'm going to try and take the bell. With the tide still rising, the crew decide that despite the churning sea, the only way to rescue the casualties is to move as close to the wall as they can and take them directly onto the bow of the lifeboat. You need to get close enough so that the people can pretty much step across. It's all about boat control and anticipating the changes in the sea that, so that you can control how close that you can get to something. Uh, Taking people from the bow is something that we practice a lot in exercises, but I've never done this in those conditions before. John moves the boat closer to the wall, familiarising himself with the wave patterns as the deck crew attempt to communicate the rescue plan to the casualties. Talk to me. What's going on? They're not responding. Trying to get them to understand what we needed to do and to highlight the risk that they were in was quite challenging. They're saying they're OK. The tide is still coming up. We will get you. They seem to be oblivious to the danger that they were in. They continue into angle. You will be in the water, mate. They actually wanted to bring their fishing rods and things with them, and we had to tell them, you have to leave it and you have to come on board. Come on, now! Get yourselves ready! I was quite assertive, or we were all quite assertive, saying, look, guys, leave the kit, let's get you safe, and we had to do that by getting them a life jacket across to them. You ready, guys? Are you ready? With the high risk of a rogue wave washing the casualties into the sea before they can be rescued, the crew's first priority is to make sure they will at least float. So once they got their life jackets, we repositioned the boat. I had Pete outside the rail, clipped on. Evan was holding my life jacket to make sure if I did slip or trip, the risk of me going in was reduced. Robin had to go down the port side rail because she was going to be the person that grabbed them in once I pulled them on board. I felt very nervous. We didn't know which direction the waves were going to push us, which made it really quite a dangerous scenario. We're going to put the on the boat, and you. We're going to grab you off quickly, OK? John slowly edges the 40-tonne lifeboat towards the wall, constantly fighting the chaotic movement of the sea. How close am I, Dan? Do you reckon? Yeah, you're about a metre and a half off the bow. From the flying bridge, it's very difficult to gauge how close you are. You need to be very close, almost touching, but you don't want to touch. Metre. East Willen knows the boat in so that it doesn't damage the boat or, or damage the casualties, you know, there's, there's a risk he'll crush them. It was the accuracy of John getting as close as he could to the casualties on that ledge. It was the timing of the waves that you couldn't see. It was the light that you needed from the moon, which we didn't have. So all the elements were against us. John continues to gently nose the bow into the casualties position. But just as they're almost within reach, a huge wave rolls out of the dark, pushes the boat away, and almost sweeps the casualties off the ledge. If these casualties end up in the water, that would be an absolute worst case. I think with them seeing our boat going up and down, probably one and a half to two metres, that started to make them realise that, yeah, they're in trouble. With the tide still rising and the waves growing bigger, John and the crew prepare for a second attempt. I had to see if I could get the boat into a better position. It's never easy, and in those circumstances, it certainly wasn't. 
For a second time, John manages to maneuver the boat to within feet of the casualties. But they hesitate and fail to make the jump. Each time that we brought the boat to the wall, we're all thinking, we have to do this now. The window of the is really small because the tide was still coming up and you've still got the wave height on top of that. So the tide may be seven metres, but you might have another two metres of a wave that could smash it. When they're ready, they've got to go. Don't let them hesitate. John prepares to go in for a third time. On that third attempt, as we nosed in, almost as, as if time slowed down in a way. The rolling waves push the boat further along the wall. Come on, guys, get along here! But John manages to keep the bow close as the crew urge the casualties to make the jump. Grab the first casualty, pulled him down my left side. I grabbed hold of him so that he didn't fall off of the boat. Got the second casualty on the second rise of the boat and then pulled him straight in. Both of them. Word the expression, your heart's in your mouth. To have them on the boat, no longer in danger, was a really massive relief. I've just recovered two people from the outboard side of the Admiralty Pier. We'll be returning to station shortly. Over. You can relax at that point, you know, they're on board. They're not injured, there's no medical emergency. They turned out to be local fishermen from Maidstone and um, they just thought they'd have a fishing night. They were quite quiet still, maybe a bit embarrassed, but all that aside, they were safe. They said thank you and they said sorry. If they'd have gone in the water, they would have been whisked away in no time at all. I've got no doubt in that sea with, uh, with no life jacket, they would have drowned very, very quickly. John, hats off. You've done well there. That's an impeccable boat hand. Yeah, hats off. On that shot, I think John did a really amazing job. It was a true show of his seamanship and boat handling skills. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. That was your shout, John. The thing I did make a comment is that weren't bad for one of your last ones, mate. And uh, he goes, yeah, it was all right, wasn't it? <laughs> Make off there, please, Evan. I will remember this shout for a long time. It was a short, sharp, intense shout with a great outcome. Um, fantastic teamwork. Well done by everybody. We last bridge, boat's all yours. Almost 300 miles away on the northeastern coast of England is the port town of Hartlepool. Hartlepool is a great little town. It's only a small community, but we have a large fishing fleet, we have a large marina, and we have a beautiful coastline, both north and south. I'm born and raised Hartlepool, uh, you know, almost 28 years here. I love it. I enjoy my holidays, but I always want to come home. A small but tight-knit community of proud locals, Hartlepudlians, are also known by another name. We actually nicknamed the Monkey Hangers. No matter where you go in the world, your accent, and the, oh, you're a monkey hanger. The monkey hanger story was actually from the uh, Napoleonic War. The French boat shipwrecked on the headland, and there was a, a little monkey washed up. No one's seen a monkey before, so we thought it was a French spy. So we hung it. It's stuck with the town ever since, like. <laughs> A hanged monkey is even the emblem of the local lifeboat, which has been operating since 1803, the same year the Napoleonic War started. We get a vast array of shouts. There's probably not a shout you can give us that we haven't been to. People use the water for pretty much everything you'd imagine. We've got the swimmers who go in the sea all year round. We've got the paddle boarders who are more summer based. We've got the fishermen. Uh, north and south of us, you have the passenger vessels. We sort of have a mixture of everything in Hartlepool. Responding to an average of 50 call outs a year, 
The Hartlepool lifeboat's most notorious shout was the search for John Darwin back in 2002. There's not many people who probably don't know about the John Darwin story now. Mr Darwin supposedly went out on a canoe and ended up going missing. Kenny and Gary were crew at the time and launched on both of Hartlepool's lifeboats. As the hours wore on with no sign of the missing canoeist, the search and public interest grew. By nine o'clock, it was on the main news, wasn't it, news. national news? Then that's when you get a lot of public coming out to have a look, see what's going on. Just think about it, one canoeist out there in the open sea, no navigational aids, no homing beacon, no radio equipment, not like a, a modern trawler might have. It's been literally like trying to find a drop in the ocean. Normally, you, you go out and search for somebody two to three hours maximum, and then you, you're on your way back, you get called off. Uh, but this was absolutely huge. Such a vast area covered, wasn't it? And I remember saying to my wife, I don't think, I just don't think he's in the water. The light is now fading in the Tees Bay behind me on what's been a very frustrating day for our rescue services. In terms of manpower and machinery involved, this has been one of the most extensive searches for many years. After 33 hours, the search was called off. And despite his body never being found, John Darwin was declared legally dead. But then, in 2007... Detectives are expected to start interviewing a canoeist who went missing five years ago off the coast near Hartlepool, but turned up safe and well at a London police station on Saturday night. He says he can't remember where he's been or why he has now come forward. Watching the news, I just jumped over. I told you. <laughs> I was like, I kind of just sat back down and I just, yeah, I told you. Another day, another chapter in this extraordinary soap opera. John Darwin very much alive and being brought to Hartlepool Magistrates Court. John Darwin was eventually convicted of fraud for faking his own death to claim the insurance money. The key to the Darwins' incredible plan was to start a new life together in Panama. The couple spent thousands on an apartment, a new car, and even a farm that they had planned to turn into an ecotourism centre for canoes. John and his wife Anne both received prison sentences and were ordered to pay back all the money they had falsely claimed. Despite everything that happened, I think we all just relieved that it's, it was safe yep. and it's alive. alive. Yeah, whether they've done something silly, that's, that's down to them. We're not there to judge. We're not there to judge. The first day of November 2022, bright and sunny, but with a strengthening offshore breeze. A call comes into the Coast Guard. Coast Guard Rescue. Hi, I'm really sorry, but I'm stuck out on a paddleboard at a uh, and I can't get back in. Right, OK. How far out are you? Uh, I don't know. Maybe like a mile, I don't know. I can see the beach, but I've been trying to get back in for about 40 minutes now and I can't get back in. I think I've just spent all my energy. Right, OK. <laughs> just stay on the phone. We're just getting some help sorted. Thank you so much. The Coast Guard alert the lifeboat but keep the casualty on the phone to continue gathering information. The pager went off and it's an immediate launch. This particular area where this casualty was and the direction of wind, she could have quite easily been blown into a heavy shipping lane. They could be up against heavy winds, they could be against heavy seas, they could have fallen from the board and gotten an injury. Every second counts, you've got to get there because, realistically, it could be someone that you're about to lose. As the crew lower their Atlantic 85 down the slipway, more information comes over the radio, revealing that there's not just one life at stake, but two. Paddleboard are getting very tired, obviously, with the weather. A small dog with her as well. As you can proceed, locate and uh, recover to safety. Received. At this point, the agency stepped up because the dog can swim, but the casualty may panic, go in the water with the dog and not be able to get back to the board. We've had one or two occasions where the pets have made it to shore 
unfortunately the owners aren't made to show. With every second now vital, Kenny the Helm plots the fastest and safest route to the casualty's location. Getting to the casualty, there's a large rock which is submerged. As the tide was on its way up and it was a spring tide, I decided then that I could cut, cut across the rock. I've gone over the rock, so watch me there. I had Jordan on the navigation, column doing the comms and radar searching. Worst case scenario is that we'll find a paddleboard, but no paddleboarder, and then we'll need to start searching for them, which is always a risk against time, and you don't want that to happen. Taking the shortcut over the rocks reduces the journey time to Seton Karoo Beach to less than five minutes. So just as we were coming over Longsco Rocks, I could see her on the horizon on my bow. It was then make a beeline straight towards them and assess the situation from there. As they approach, the casualty appears to be safe and well, so the crew turn their attention to dealing with the dog. Probably have to bring the dog on first. When you hear a dog's involved, you're always a little bit apprehensive. Is it going to be aggressive because it's cold, it's, it just wants to go home? When they're scared or if they're not exactly the friendliest dog, they might bite you. Standard operating procedure when handling any dog is to put on protective gloves. Even if the dog in question yeah, I'm not the dog. is a chihuahua. Hello, little doggy. I didn't think it was a dog at first, it was that small. Personally, I consider chihuahuas to be the demons of the dogs. They can be quite vicious for their size. The dog just seemed cold. <laughs> I gave him straight to Ken and just curled up in Ken's lap. With the chihuahua safely on board and under control, the crew are now free to rescue its owner. Just cold? Yeah. Anything else going on or just, just the coldest tiredness? <laughs> Once we got her on board, you could see she was visibly cold. Put a jacket on to see if we can get a warm dog. Do shift back slightly, we'll get you a nice seat, and then we'll head back. Rather than risk the two-mile journey back to station in an open boat, the crew decide to wrap up both casualty and dog and get them back to the nearest beach. We're going to get the Coast Guard team to meet you back at Sandy Car Park, where you launch from. We'll get you back in, eh? The lifeboat heads to shore, with Kenny on the helm doing his best to shelter the casualty from the chilling wind. It's an open boat, so you're open to all the elements. And this particular day, with the strong wind, it was absolutely freezing. I won't go fast to try and keep the wind off her a bit. All right. You're blocking it quite well. Sorry? You're blocking it quite well. All right. That's it. That wasn't meant how it came out. <laughs> he didn't quite take that the way I thought he would. I was more meaning a joking fashion. He took it a bit personally, I think. I can't believe I get called fast. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't my <laughs> The lifeboat gets as close to land as it can. Then the casualty and crew have to wade the rest of the way to shore. I jumped off uh, and held the ILB. Uh, then Jordan got the casualty off. We wanted the dog to go with the casualty because that's who the dog feels safest with. It was in a case of just slowly walking her back to shore. I think Ken was definitely sad to see the dog do the form of bond for life. On the beach, the casualty, Nikki, is met by the Coast Guard. Both she and her dog, Remy, are checked over, warmed up, and then given the all clear to head home. This was my first time going paddleboarding on my own. I was a little bit nervous, but I was looking forward to being in the waves and just having some peace and quiet. I lifted Remy on the board and we paddled out. First realised that things were going wrong when I tried to get back into shore. I was trying my hardest to, to paddle in and it just felt like I was getting nowhere further forward. Remy was starting to get cold and tired himself. He tried to swim back to shore and abandon me. I was really panicking, but I didn't have the energy to swim after him. He got to a certain point and I think he realised, oh no, I better turn back and, and come back for help. Cold and shivering, 
Nikki decided to call 999 before she drifted too far from land and lost signal. When I seen the lifeboat coming towards me, I just felt the surge of relief. I just knew we were going to be safe and everything was going to be fine. Definitely felt like a job well done. And at the end of the day, we went out, we assisted, and we possibly saved someone's life and their dog as well. So it's not just the person, it's the animal. Seven dog, half dog. I was a bit embarrassed about needing to be rescued, but I was just so grateful that they had come because I don't know what would have happened if I didn't call for help. You don't have to be sorry for calling the lifeboats out. If you need assistance, call us. We're never all to grudge. I can't believe you called me fat. I didn't call you fat. Oh, you blocked the wheel pretty well there, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Rem. After her paddleboarding adventure with Remy, Nikki has been wary of returning to the ocean. I haven't been out on the paddleboard again, but I don't want it to put me off because being out there is just so great. I would do a lot of things differently. I would not go by myself. I would check the weather more thoroughly. I'd be prepared to call it a day if the sea did get too rough. Fortunately, Remy seems unscathed by his ordeal. Remy still enjoys the sea just as much as he did before. He's an adrenaline junkie. We do everything together. He's my best friend. In Hoylake, Mark has also learned a valuable lesson from his time in the Mersey mud. Since the accident, you're more and more aware of the fact that I basically got away with it that time. I could have been killed. I'm now extremely cautious about where I go. I would never walk along the beach where there was mud again. No matter how careful you are, you can get into danger very quickly. And after nine months of recovery and intense therapy, Dan has returned to Cowshot to say thank you to the team who brought him back to life following his jet ski accident. Hello, everyone. Good Are you Kelly? I am Kelly. Oh, my God. I'm so pleased to meet you, Kelly. You're oh. my saviour. Oh, <laughs> Thank you ever so much for bringing me back to life again, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> it means a lot It was a team me. effort. There was other yeah, two others. Yeah, thank you. You too as well. That's Andy. Nice to meet How you doing, you. Andy? Chris. How you doing, Chris? Hello, mate. Oh, honestly, Kelly, words cannot describe how much you actually mean to me, you know? I feel like I'm going to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't yeah. you start, cos I will cry, honestly. Thank you so much, Kelly. You are so welcome. You brought me back to life again, and you made me the man who I am today, so... Well, you know, take your second chance and, I'm gonna you know, run chance with it. And run with it. Yeah. 100 mile an hour. <laughs> no, maybe not. No, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that to your parents. <laughs> OK, fella, how you doing? I've very infrequently seen a guy who looks more like he's about to die. <gasps> it scared the life out of me. Don't, because if the rod touches the boat, it's going to hurt. A piece of metal had just gone straight through his finger. <gasps> and every time it moves, it's causing him agonising pain. Yeah, yeah. What the fuck If the boat goes on the rocks, the engine hits, I'd say that was game over. 